Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming May of 2017 Premier Firearms Auction. And the one we're looking at today is a rather unique, lightweight Browning High Power. Now the story for this thing goes back to 19, well, the end of World War II, 1947 roughly. Uh, NATO has been formed and the various NATO countries are potentially interested in standardizing their military equipment. Now this debacle we know about primarily from rifles where the M14, the FAL, the EM2, all of these guns were, were being uh, tossed around for some time. However, this was also an issue with handguns. Really, it was an issue with everything. And when it comes to handguns, well, it uh, became known in 1947 that the US Army was potentially interested in finding a gun that was a bit, a handgun, that was a bit lighter than the 1911. Uh, they liked the Browning High Power that was being made by Inglis up in Canada, but it really wasn't that much lighter than the 1911. So in its stock form, yeah, not really interested in, in switching over to it. However, it was communicated that maybe there'd be some interest if the gun were lighter. So in 1947, uh, Canadian Arsenals Limited, in conjunction with like the Canadian Mining and Resources Board or someone like that, um, they actually started working on lightening the gun. The first project was just to lighten the slide. They took a standard gun and they made a bunch of milling cuts to the slide to remove material. And they submitted that uh, in the middle of 1947, and that came back uh, pretty well received. Seemed good, didn't do any damage to the pistol, and took some weight off. And so they then took the next step, which was to investigate aluminum alloy frames instead of the standard steel frame. That had the potential to substantially reduce the weight of the gun. So the first uh, iteration of this was a series of six machined aluminum frames that were manufactured. Uh, it cost the Canadian government, uh, I believe, $1,075 to have six frames made, and these were milled from aluminum bar stock. So not the most cost-effective way to do it, but for a prototype run, that makes sense. You don't have to invest in, you know, like molding, uh, casting dies or anything. So of these six guns, uh, six frames, they were all assembled, and two of them were sent to Canadian military for testing, two of them were sent to the British military for testing, and two of them were sent to the American military for testing. Now this happens to be one of the American guns. Um, I believe in fact all five of the others, the, the locations are currently known. There are I think one or two in private collections and the rest in various museums. Now it's interesting to look at what these different countries actually did with these test pistols. So the Canadians ran a military trial and that came back quite positive as you'd kind of expect. Uh, the guns were definitely lighter. Uh, these went from 34 ounces to 25 and a half ounces, so a substantial weight reduction. And you can tell that just handling the thing. It really does feel lightweight. Um, the Canadian test, they were interested in things like muzzle velocity. Well, that's not gonna change at all, and didn't. The accuracy didn't really change at all. Um, they did note that yes, the recoil was a bit more substantial, but they said it was not important. Uh, it was well within the tolerance of all their shooters and, and not something they considered a problem. However, it did miserably fail their sand testing. And in fact, one of the reasons that they gave for that was a little hole in the bottom of the magazine. So they recommended that that hole be filled and the magazine floor plate redesigned. But other than that, it seemed like a pretty good pistol. So the lightweight slide of the high power involved cutting this and this in the slide. Uh, this cutout is always there because when you disassemble the gun, that lines up with the slide stop pin, and that's there as a little bit of thumb relief for pushing that pin out. A matching pair of scalloped cuts were made on the left side of the frame here as well, and then a big scoop out the top just in front of the rear sight. So those were the changes made to the slide. So curiously, the U.S. testing wasn't quite so relevant as what the Canadians had done. Um, it does kind of make me wonder if there wasn't perhaps some confusion when these guns arrived um, as to what exactly they were and what they were there for. Uh, because what the U.S. appears to have done is simply use the, this high power in a comparative test with a couple other guns to test penetration of pistol cartridges on standard M1 steel helmets. So they did determine that the lightened high power with Canadian manufacturer 9mm ammunition 
was in fact the most capable at penetrating helmets. It could go through a, an M1 helmet at 120 yards, where the, uh, the 45 caliber 1911 uh, maxed out at like 25 yards. But that's not exactly the point of a specially lightened aluminum frame pistol like this. So that's a bit odd. We'll come back to the US in a moment. Now the British testing uh, was more substantial than the Canadians. They actually ran three separate trials on these lightweight pistols. Now, in their first trial, um, well, really, they, they kind of came to the same conclusions as the Canadians. Uh, they did also do a mud test on the guns, which they failed miserably. These were being compared against the 38 caliber uh, Webley Enfield revolvers that were in service, and the test report notes that the revolvers worked much better in sand and mud, and these, not so much. Uh, but that's not, has no relation to the alloy frame, that's just the semi-automatic design in general. Uh, so a second test was kind of inconclusive, and then there was a third. They, they were curious about the durability and the, the wear of the aluminum frame. And so they ran a third test and had some relatively serious analysis done. And they came to the conclusion that, yes, the aluminum frame was definitely more susceptible to wear, especially when running against or directly in contact with a steel slide. Uh, when sand or grit got into the gun, it would wear the frame much more seriously um, when it was wearing against a steel slide. Uh, however, they didn't find that to be a serious problem. Just, you know, it happened, but it didn't happen to enough magnitude to be an issue. What was a problem, uh, well, there were two problems. The slide stops appear to have been machined kind of out of spec and caused some malfunctions, but the test report notes that that also had nothing to do with the frame. What did have to do with the frame was the locking block, which is, it's not that, it's under the slide stop here and right there this had a tendency to egg out its hole. So the high power has a tipping barrel much like a 1911, and the barrel itself is connected to, well, has this cam track, which runs in a block in the frame. That block, right there, is uh, subjected to some pretty serious impact forces every time the gun fires, both when it uh, cycles back and when the slide runs forward back into battery. And the block itself is just fine. It's nice hardened steel. But when it's in an aluminum frame, it tends to oval out these holes that it's mounted in. The stress on the aluminum bends it, basically, deforms it. And so you can see on this particular example, that has clearly happened. And what they've done is to set the block back firmly in place, they've peened the bejesus out of it here on both sides. Well, actually not a little bit on this side, much more so over here. Uh, and the British testing did come back with that being a, a very definite issue. They wanted to investigate some ways that they could maybe ameliorate that problem. You could potentially do that if you had a steel insert. What you would want to do is, what is expand the surface area of this block so that it's acting on a wider surface of the aluminum, distributing that, that force uh, more widely. All in all, this testing was a little bit inconclusive. Uh, one of the other things going on at the same time was the potential interest in a double action version of the high power. And I think most officials kind of saw that as more relevant. And so people were more concerned with that development program and this one got left behind a bit. Now, they did continue this testing um, after, after the tests of these machined frames. They did go back and manufacture a cast version of the frame. Uh, they cast a total of 29 rough frames with a couple different alloy materials, ended up assembling those into 21 pistols, so eight of them didn't make the cut at that point. And then they, they tested those pistols and actually had a fair amount of problem, problems with them. Um, they just weren't all that durable and they tended to break. Ultimately, in April of 1951, the whole lightweight frame project was officially terminated in Canada. That's not quite the very end of the lightweight high power story though, because in a kind of weird anecdotal side note, uh, in 1952, there was some further interest in testing these by the, the US Army, and uh, four of the existing guns were sent down. Uh, nothing really came of that testing, except that one particular major general, A.H.J. Uh, Kessels, or Kessels, um, happened to see one of the pistols. It was, it was shown to him by a junior officer, and, uh, General Castles was an interested uh, firearm enthusiast and really liked this lightweight high power and asked if he could possibly get one. And since they weren't really much of a military controlled item at that point, they were just kind of leftovers, 
uh, a quartermaster in Canada was able to basically write one off, assemble it into a pistol, and ship it to him. And uh, the Major General ended up carrying it in the Korean War. No information on whether he actually used it. I suspect he did not. But funny that for all of its testing, the, the service history of the lightweight English high power turns out to have been one Major General carrying one as a sidearm in the Korean War. Well, there you go. A neat look into the the arms experimentation of the 1940s into the early 1950s. Now, if you'd like to have this one yourself, uh, it is probably the only one that will be available for quite some time, given that most of the others are in museums. Well, take a look at the description text below, and you'll find Rock Island's, a link to Rock Island's catalog page for this pistol. And you can take a look at their pictures, description, price estimate, etc. And if you're interested in it, you can place a bid online or come here and participate live in the auction. Thank you for watching.